welcome back to the Paddle and Fin Podcast Network. We're brought to you by Yak Gadget. For all your kayak fishing accessory needs, go to yakgadget.com. Pelican cases, coolers, and lighting. Go to pelican.com. The 153 Bait Company. For all your hard and soft bait needs, go to the 153anglers.com. Now let's get this show started. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to The Real Down. Real quick, if you're following us on YouTube, Facebook, anything like that, give us a like, give us some shares, You know, follow if you're on the tube. Uh, we appreciate everybody and all of our listeners. Uh, just me this week, no co-host. Uh, letting Dan do his thing. You know, Drew's being a daddy, taking care of the baby. I uh, figured I'd just do a little uh, solo show. I, I I don't mind it at all. I actually enjoy it, kind of. Uh, but this one's going to, when this one airs on Wednesday, uh, we will be, me and Brian will be headed down to Florida to do a little fishing at the KBF event. So everybody wish us luck. And then uh, Nick, the week after, we will be doing a, like a recap show on here. Talk about that. Have the winners. Maybe it's us. You never know. But uh, what we got going on this week is uh, we wanted to take a step back and check out the uh, Dugout Bait and Tackle uh, championship event they had that went in conjunction with the online series they started in October that ran uh, up through January. So, uh, you know, without further ado, we got the man that took home the win in the online series, Mr. Josh Little. What's going on? Not a whole lot, man. How are you doing? Pretty good, man. I appreciate you hopping on with me this evening and uh, telling us how late Lanier went, man. But uh, before we get into that, man, tell us a little about yourself. Um, more or less born and raised in Georgia. I got into the kayak side back in 2018. Um, I had tried it once or twice and wouldn't, didn't really know what I was getting myself into. And from there, dove off the deep end, started fishing some of the tournaments. And, and I really enjoyed it a lot. I, I like the competition, but also I like traveling around and fishing different lakes and learning new bodies of water and it just kind of it all worked together being able to do a little bit of everything so that was kind of where i, I started making that venture and last year i jumped off and fished with mlf as a co-angler for the phoenix series here in georgia with the bulldog division so that's been been a lot of fun too but this year i think i'm gonna focus more on the kayak this year uh, than i did last year last year i, I fished all the tournaments for the MLF series, um, and it was fun, but it was just it. It's different because you can't pre-fish anything from a sense of going out with the boater. Yeah, uh, you're paired up with the boater the night before, and just you get to go out there and try to catch a fish off the back of someone's boat. So, I like the kayak side a lot better. I think. Oh, definitely. So, I, I, I the the co angler thing does interest me. I'd like to do it a couple of times because I do think it's fun, especially you know like. When the back boater is the guy that figures it out, I don't know. You can kind of just like hold your head high, you know. Yeah. But yeah. uh, but yeah, no, uh, I definitely feel you on the kayak thing. Well, uh, speaking of that, so what's what's your plans? Are you gonna like focus solely on a local trail this year, or are you going to hit some national stuff? You know, follow one or more multiple series. What's your plans? Uh, so it's gonna be kind of a multiple, I guess you'd say. Um, the first one I'm gonna be fishing is with the Georgia Bass Nation at Lake Ufala on February 26th. And gonna fish some of the Hobies, we're gonna be at Santee, and then we'll be back at Ufala, and then we're definitely gonna fish Chickamauga. So I'm gonna make sure to fish all three of those. And then there's a couple of local trails that I'll fish as well. And it's kind of a pick and choose with the local trails. Really just depends on the body of water, make sure between time, and then also with work, just make sure it all kind of works out. Um, but I, I may fish a few of the KBF events, but, um, I really like the way that Hobie does their events. I think they do a great job and then Bass looking forward to their first full year of really diving into it and having multiple tournaments with the state of Georgia this year. So yeah. going to try to look over everything. All right. I hear you. Is there, um, even though you picking and choosing in locals, is there like a local club that you consider like your home club that you like kind of stick with more than anything or you just kind of float a lot of it depends on the body of water but i would say the best one in georgia i think that that i have found 
that I like the best is the Peach State Kayak Anglers. Mm-hmm. They run a great trail, uh, a lot of great guys there. Um, they give you a real good feel for going into a tournament. No questions as far as, hey, when are we supposed to be out of the water, things like that. I mean, they're very cut and dry. This is about how it is, and this is the way it is. Um, and, yeah, and I'll fish some with the TVK as well. I think they do a great job out there in Tennessee. Um, it's another one of my Steve, favorite ones to fish. Steve-O does great at just about anything he's got his hand on. Uh, he's yeah. a great tournament director. He runs that club real well. And, you know, the, the Dugout Online series has been a huge hit, you know, and I'm sure that that's probably 95% him if it's not 100% him doing all of that. Uh, but, yeah, no, I, I hit TVK every now and then when I can because they come down here to Gunnersville. I'm yeah. over here in Alabama, so I try to – try to go swing around with the Tennessee hammers a little bit when they come down here. It hadn't worked out too well so far, but <laughs> you know, I'll get it figured out one of these days. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, uh, so talking about the online series, uh, I'll let you break it down for people outside of our area. Cause this podcast gets listened to all over this country and, uh, 71 other countries. So, you know, give awesome. everybody a rundown of what, uh, the dugouts online series was this year. So this year they really opened up for multiple states, um, kind of the southeast, I guess you'd say, more focused. But it allowed anybody that was fishing multiple events, whether it be bat with bass or with Hobie or with the KBF, you can fish the online series as well if you were in any of those states. And more or less it's a month-long tournament. They would pull a qualification for the championship round every week. And then they would pull a total – uh, a few at the end of the month for your top your top tier guys that were there. Uh, and they ran that through um, October, November, and December. And this year, with there being a lot more guys that were involved, you've seen some really big bags across the board. And I, and I really knew that the fact that Alabama and Florida, I mean, there's big bags there all the time. But we, we actually had a guy from, I believe it was North Carolina, he had them that was 24 inches for one of the tournaments, which was just a monster of a bass. And I, I wasn't anticipating that from North Carolina. But, right. uh, <laughs> I mean. Well, they they it, were raising it, that fish. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was, uh, I was surprised. But it's a lot of fun because they do weekly giveaways. It's a $30 buy-in. You can fish it any day you want to. It's just your top five. And they use Tourney X, so it allows you to, to well, more or less return X to Cole or however you want to do it. But every Sunday they pull the top guys, and then they also do a drawing of 25 winners every week. So everybody was getting stuff anyways for the most part. But I think every month we had more than 95 people that were involved uh, between the three months. And these giveaways, folks, for everybody that's listening, you know, the dugout bait and tackle – uh, it's a you know high end tackle store. You know they they carry all the nice nice goodies, and they don't they don't go light on the giveaways. They gave away a nice reel every week. They gave away uh, Dakota bunch Lithium. Of baits. Yeah, Dakota yeah. Lithium. I think they did gift cards. I can't remember if that was yeah. last. They did that again because I know they did in the winter series, but yeah, just tons the winter of stuff. Series, yeah. And I mean it was worth it. Like last year, I entered it. I never fished. I, you know, but it was. <laughs> I think out of the three months, I think I won three times. So when you get all these baits in from some of these companies, it beats your total that you spent putting in. So it was worth the giveaways. Yeah. And then, and like they draw, uh, like like you might draw that you know like a fifty to a hundred that hundred dollar battery or however much that Dakota is. I mean, it's just worth the yeah. chance. And I won't be surprised if they expand it again next year because I mean it's been a success because it last year it was the winter series is the way yep. it was kind of marketed um same thing this year it was just a lot bigger but uh yeah g- give us a little rundown on uh so what they did was as he said from october to january it, you know it was kind of an ongoing tournament and then there were weekly winners but it also there is a championship at the end of it that you qualified for so yep. how did that work if you want to explain that a little bit so more or less every month they they pull more than a total of ten people from each month. So between October, November, December, and then those thirty fish in January at a random drawn lake. 
this year. It just happened to be Lanier. And I actually missed qualification, I think, back in October. That was my largest bag and just barely missed qualifying for it. Well, there was a roll down for one of the guys that could not fish, and I picked the roll down slot. So that allowed, and they do it based off a month. They don't just do it off of total. They just allow you to more or less from each month. They'll start from October and kind of go back. So yeah. that that's how they, they qualify. Those are, you get qualification is through those months from each tournament. Awesome. Well, you talk about something that worked out in your favor. Get <sighs> get slid in on a roll down and then take everybody. Yes. Take it. Man, that's awesome. Well, um, so as you said, it was on Lake Lanier out there in georgia so give us a rundown i know how lakeland what Lake Lanier is like i want to fish it so bad but i just haven't maybe i was trying to get get out that way when craig die was out there all the time and living out that direction yeah. and now he he's done moved over here to alabama and texted me and was like so when when we going to gunnersville so i guess i'll show him <laughs> our nasty grass lakes out here but uh yep. tell us all about lake lanier um so when i found i qualified I, hold on. I'm going to write the time down. I lost your audio. I don't hear you. You hear me now? I do. Give me okay. one second. We'll say 1130. Okay. There we go. So right. you, you can just start um, off like I just asked you the question. Okay. So I found out Tuesday night that I actually qualified for the, the championship round. And... Lake Lanier is probably one of my favorite lakes to fish, locally anyways, but I didn't have any time to pre-fish. Going into it, I kind of anticipated the water being in the high 40s. I get out there, and water temps were 54 mid-lake where I was fishing at. Um, and, and what I based it off of is when I fished one of the, the MLF tournament last year, some of the areas that we hit, it was – the fish were just there and the conditions were kind of the same. It was a cold morning, a lot of wind, rain that was anticipating moving in. Uh, and it was coming in later that day, but the winds were right around 15 miles an hour. And it was one of those that I knew I was going to have to get on main Lake to go up to this area. It was about a mile and a half, two mile trip up the lake. And honestly, I just, I knew there was fish there last year and was hoping that based off of those conditions that the fish would just maintain and kind of stay in that area. I know the spotted bass, and I know they move, but there's a lot of, a lot of structure there, a lot of places that they can more or less get away from the wind, get away from uh, anything they need to, there's deep water, good ditches in the area. So for me, it just kind of made sense just to go there. It was kind of so, all or nothing. Right. So, as a rundown for the lake, Lake Lanier is, you know, d deeper, clear lake, typically, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, your visibility is generally anywhere from eight foot and more, depending on the location that you're fishing. So. That's crazy. Yeah. And it's different because I fish Alatuna a lot, which is on the other side, and it, it fishes a lot dirtier, and it's... Uh, Excuse me. Sorry about that. The um, spirit. It's enough. The um, more or less. Well, I'll hang out a second. Let him get that handle. So, more or less, right now we are staying in a camper as our house is being built. So oh. this is. Yeah, it's a little hectic right now, to say the least. Oh no, I understand. We've actually debated on getting rid of our house for a camper. Yeah. And. I think it's an absolutely crazy idea, but I still kind of want to do it. Two two dogs, me, the wife, my daughter. It's probably a terrible idea, but I don't know why I'm attracted to it. I, I really enjoy it, but with two boys and the three dogs, it makes it a slight bit difficult, to say the least. So, um, but we're we're looking forward to to the house being done. Just just a couple more months, and we'll be out of here. So, heck yeah. Uh, well, it's kind of cool if you're going traveling fishing tournaments, you can just take your house with you. Yeah, yeah, that part would be nice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Load up, fam. We're out. 
<laughs> oh yeah, exactly. Um, and, and honestly, was, originally it was like, man, we could after the house is done, we can we can keep this and just use this for the tournaments, but uh, all the guys can stay here and not to worry about anything. So because it'll yeah. it'll sleep like ten people, so it, it's a fairly large one, but. Um, the dogs make it feel small to say the least. So, I understand. <laughs> I've got one small dog and one medium sized dog and it makes my house feel like this big and I don't understand it. Like how, how can 150 pounds, no 110 pounds total of two dogs be everywhere all the time. <laughs> There's hair everywhere all the oh, time. Dude. dude. Yeah. <laughs> I understand. We, we have a shepherd and she is, um, she, she's by far the worst when it comes to shedding and she weighs maybe 70 pounds but then we have a mal mix he's he's massive he's like 120 pounds um and it, it's a um he's he looks like a wolf it's, it's more or less what he is he's like a wolf dog um yeah and then we've got a pit so none of them are small <laughs> but i feel you but yeah, so anyway, so Lake Lanier, yeah, comparing it to Lake Altoona, it, it's completely different. Lake Altoona does have some clear water, but the fish are a lot smaller. Um, most of the water is a lot dirtier. And then you go over to Lanier, and there's been days that, I mean, you can see 12 foot down, and it's like, you know the fish are just staring at you the whole time. So, That's cool. Um, it's a lot of fun. I really enjoy it because I think it is, you have to learn to fish it differently. Um, and it's the biggest reason I had to learn how to fish a drop shot was because of that lake. So uh, that's what I've always thought. Something I've added. I'm, I, I might be able to go there and figure it out relatively quick is because I love the drop shot already. You know, I throw you really? all kind of, Oh yeah. I, a buddy of mine in Tennessee got me turned on to it. I mean that, you know, watching Greg Blanchard videos and Greg Blanchard is like, he was uh, when I first started watching Greg two or three years ago, I mean, he still throws it all the time now, but that was like his thing, man. Drop shots and frogs. That's what you watched his YouTube yeah. for. But, uh, I got on that, uh, for a winter deal and, you know, up here on Wheeler Lake. And that was the only thing you could catch fish with was a drop shot, really? you know, in this small trailer. And now I just make like, like we're going to Florida and I know that probably doesn't sound like it, but it will be tied on just because that sometimes you can just force them to eat it. Like, you know, uh, instead of rigging it like normal, man, I've like played with throwing wacky rigs on the drop shot and it just yeah. gives it like a suspended wacky profile. It's just different. I mean, it works, but anyway, I love the drop shot. So I feel you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I throw haze dong on the, uh, on the drop shot, just the mega bass haze dong. Yeah. And I've tried the worm and I've caught some on a worm, but I, I catch more fish on that haze dong. I happen to have one of those right there. <laughs> yep. There I you go. Thrown, I, I threw a little bit, some of those on a drop shot. I haven't had any success, but I've been throwing this on the back of chatter baits. And it, it seems overkill, but I'll just like cut the head off. Yeah. But it's just got it's got a little bit less of a thump than some baits and a little more thump than others. So it's like I just yeah. something different. A little thinner profile. Yeah. Give it a little track. That's more like the easy shiner. That the kind of easy shiner. That's something I've had Never. luck with on the drop shot. Really? I haven't yeah, tried the, it on the, the drop shot yet. I the need to. little bitty easy shiners, the like two and a half or two, two. and quarters. Yeah. yeah. They are, they were money. Hmm. It, it, you know, I, nothing compares to a good old uh, robo worm for me. Yeah. yeah. The robo worms like the bread and butter, Aaron's morning dawn. But uh, those, uh, those easy shiners, I, I got, you know, as a tactical bass and trick, I, I took away from one of their videos and was like, why not? We'll buy something else. They told me it works. Yeah, so, oh, it yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, you said the morning dawn. I've had very little success with morning dawn, and I don't know why. Makes no sense because I see people catch a fish on it all the time. You know, and that that's me with a lot of natural colors. Like guys, they'll throw like green pumpkin, like a green pumpkin worm with a chartreuse tip, or they'll get some of them like uh, the KVD ones that come in like the ghost minnow and stuff. That yeah, uh, what do they call those? easy drop dream drop whatever it is Dream, and, uh, yeah i cannot get bit with anything that looks like it should get bit but i'll throw that aaron's morning dawn and then i've got uh morning dawn and chartreuse and that's just the money 
for some reason. I don't know why. Man. I've tried That's four crazy. and a half, six and a half. They all work, but that. But you know, like when I grew up, like all the old men threw bubble gum, pink worms, you know, and yeah, it makes no sense to me, but whatever, it works. <laughs> That's what I started with. with yeah. Bubble gum, trick worm. That was have no idea why, but it worked. Yeah, no, I so. feel that. some some stuff. Yeah, you just don't question it. If it, yeah, like I got away from fishing, came back to fishing. You know, I was away from fishing for like a little over ten years. You know, didn't have any more stuff. And just like last year, that bubblegum pink popped in my head, and I bought a pack of bubblegum pink Senkos. And like me feeling like I've kind of grown up and I'm a little more of an adult fisherman now, I was like, oh, this isn't going to work. It's not natural colored blah. First cast of that, I caught a fish and I was like, God, okay. <laughs> Still works. <laughs> That's right. Oh, man. But yeah. That's but, awesome. Uh, so yeah, Lake Lanier's clear, got a lot of visibility, and. It's primarily spotted bass, right? That's definitely like the major winner there, yeah. typically. Uh, so give us a, I'm trying to think of another way we can get into Lake Lanier. So is it a fairly large lake, you know, lots of access points, or was everybody kind of congested around each other? How was it? No, so actually Lake Lanier is probably one of the largest lakes around in our area, and there's a a whole bunch of boat ramps that you can put in at. And I mean, you could be at the back end of the Creek and there's a boat ramp there. And then at the very front, as you started out, I mean, like there's one there and it seems like it's that way all over the place. So I knew there was a couple of ramps that were going to have bass boat tournaments going out of it. And this, this area, actually, I was like, well, no one shows that there's a tournament going out of there. So this one should work well. Um, I get there, pull up, I think it was somewhere around 30 and there was probably 15 boats there already that were bass boats and they were fishing a tournament out of there. So I was like, well, all right, I mean, no big deal is what it is. Uh, try to give them the space that they need so they can get in the water and everything. But we had three other kayaks that put it in there. And you know, I knew all three guys, so it was good. But they were headed in a completely different direction than I was going. So it just, for me, it was like, well, I'm going to head up that way and just kind of go my gut feeling. And oh, yeah, that's that way. Actually, so yeah, that's a, you know, I hear a lot of people, like when uh, local level, like people getting into tournament fishing, you know, like they definitely worry about congestion. You know, you a lot of folks see bass boats and get deterred. You know, like, you know, just a, a good tip, and you said it, man. You were talking about, like, you were checking to see what ramps had tournaments going out of them. That's something a lot of people don't even think about doing, because I'm guilty of it. You know, I've we've had a tournament on Gunnersville before, and I was like, oh, yeah, you know, it's the right time of year, blah, blah, blah. Didn't think about checking my spot, show up, and there's, like, 45 boats in a line waiting to get in. And, yeah, I can get in the water still. You know, I can go put in off the bank or whatever, but, I mean, you – you're right there when blast off happens and they're fishing out of that yeah. ramp. And it's and like, and like, I don't know about your area, but my area where the ramp is, is a pretty congested area. So it can get, you know, hairy, you know, if you don't, you're not used to it. And then, you know, peace of mind, like you said, you more kayak folks get there, but you know, them, you know, it, that kind of sets my mind at ease too. And I know well, me and you aren't, you know, competing for water. So it, that's yeah. definitely a, one of those, moments where you're like all right you know, i can get in and go do my thing and not have to worry about yeah. these dudes oh yeah and it, it's it, the bass boat the biggest reason i think about it is because i know for them they get frustrated right off the right off the rip if they see kayaks pulling up and they've got a bass boat tournament going on there like i know in the back of their head they're like great these guys are gonna hold us up they're gonna cause issues um and i generally wheel my kayak down the ramp every time i'm not gonna back it down just due to the fact that for me, it's a lot easier to unload it, wheel it down to the water, just jump in it and take off. Um, it's heavier, but at the same time, I'm not sitting in a ramp or next to a ramp. And, and we've had it happen before where guys will back down, they'll put the kayak in, and they'll sit it right on the ramp or outside the ramp. And these guys on the bass boats, some know that, hey, I can still back down. And then other guys are just, they'll sit there and they'll wait. They'll, they'll think that just because the kayak's right there that they, they can't back them. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I definitely, you know, for people listening, 
don't be that guy that blocks the ramp. Please don't. No one likes you yeah. when you block the ramp. And, you know, like you said, sometimes you'll be out of the way and the boaters still hold up just because what I've done in the past is because, like, we had, like, three of us off to the side, and this is, like, a double ramp, and this guy would not back down. You know, he was, like, looking at us like, it's our fault. And I kind of smarted off and was like, what, you can't back your trailer down? Do you need me to do it for you? And then he backed down. Don't do that either, because that's terrible advice. But I was just mad at that point. Like, you got 15 feet between me and the other dock. If you can't get that boat down there, you probably shouldn't be, you know, owning that bad boat. You know what I'm talking about? Like, Yeah. Oh, yeah. uh, yeah, Most of those guys, they're just mad because we catch fish better than they do. That's what it is. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I, I would agree with you there. So, yeah. well, uh, so you didn't have any time pre-fishing. You have, a, you're, you're actually doing something you hear a lot of people say, don't you were fishing history, right? You know, yes. based off of a previous tournament a year ago. So, uh, well, tell us about what happened, man. How, how did it go? Like, uh, give us a layout of what the conditions were like when you started, uh, like pre-frontal, was it already raining as it was coming in or how was it going? So I anticipated the rain to come in a lot earlier, but it actually didn't, uh, which is kind of what shocked me. Because um, with Georgia, you just you never know. They'll say, "Hey, you're not going to see rain until five, and then it's going to show up at seven o'clock that morning." Um, I, we live next door to you. I understand these weather yeah. patterns that don't exist. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so we put in. I knew that it was going to be cold, and knew that the wind was already there, but. I swear every time I get to the water, the wind's at least 10 more miles faster than it was when I was on the road. At least it's the way it feels. Um, so I get out there and just kind of started making my way up towards the uh, the spot that I was headed towards. And I guess about halfway up, I, I started getting some weird noise on my drive. And Uh-oh. I'm in the Hobie 360, and I just, I was like, okay, that, it hadn't happened before, but I've had it a year. And I haven't had the first issue with it. So it was just squeaking. And I was like, okay, well, that's not that's not, not crazy. It's mechanical. Something's going to squeak. I mean, whatever. So I continued to head up there. And then it was like you hit the incline button on the treadmill. And it just uh, started slowing down. And it just got louder. So, but I was already like 35, 40 minutes into my trip up to this area. I was like, I'm not going back. Like, if it breaks, it breaks. I'm, I'm too far in now. Um, so I just, I continued to head up. And wind, of course, was blowing into my face the whole way. So that of course. made it worse. Yeah. Um, but I get up before I get into the pocket that I was looking for. I cast into the bank. And I was throwing a spinnerbait on my way up this area. And because the wind was blowing into it, I mean, it just, it looked perfect. A lot of rocks. Not the first thing. So I, I picked up a jig head with a little easy shiner on it. First cast up there, one hit it, takes off with it, and it comes off. So I was like, all right, well, at least I know that there's fish. I'm, I'm, there's fish here. Um, so I just continued up to the pocket, and when I get up into the pocket, cast a drop shot, and I was throwing a haze on. Caught the first one. Uh, it was not a big. It was 15 and a half inches. And then as I was going around one of the docks, I see just a massive school sitting in a ditch. So I, I cast that kayak out there and started bringing it back over. Get you see hit. it on your electronics or because it yeah. was so clear you looked down and saw it? <laughs> I, I've seen it on the electronics, yeah. That's what I figured. Uh, on my side imaging, yeah. Now, what um, electronics are you running? I'm running a Lorentz. It's an HDS Live. Nice. So I'm, I don't have the active target. It's, it's just a live. Um, I'm, I'm kind of on the fence about it. I, I know that it's probably something that I should get because you, we're kind of in the stages now where you have to have the panoptics or the active target to compete with some of the other guys that really know how to use it and get it honed in. Um, that's, that's definitely something. You know, there's been talk about it in the industry you know, about, I mean, everybody's heard it. Should it be allowed and stuff like that? Is it an advantage? It is a tool. Uh, you know, you can look yeah. at it both ways that like you, like you kind of said, 
it's not that you have to have one to compete. You have to have one to compete against the guys that know how to use it. Because once yeah. you dial in what it, cause you know, like, uh, uh, Robert Weicker actually, me and him were talking about it cause he's got live scope that I was debating on buying from him. And he was like, man, that's a great tool. He's like, but you will sit and waste time on fish that just are not biting that day, you know, because you get so caught up into being able to see them and try and force them to bite. So there's, there's all sorts of advantages and disadvantages. That's a whole other show. We won't get into that. Oh, I, I feel you though. It's, it's kind of, that's one of those reasons I'm like, I want it, but at the same time, I, you take the chance of, like you said, you're just going to sit there and look for something that, I mean, may or may not work for you. Uh, what, what finally like turned me away from it, because I mean, do I think it'd be a fantastic tool? I could learn, yeah, but I want to learn to effectively use, you know, traditional sonar down inside imaging, like to the best of my ability. Like some of these people, like uh, like Tom Kazmierski and Adam Riser yeah. and stuff like that, that can really run a graph. Like I feel like if I go straight to live scope before I'm really dialed in on that, I kind of am skipping a step. It, it, to me, it almost feels yeah. like you're cutting that learning curve off, you know, kind of cheating, not cheating, but cheating yourself out of like, I, I want to learn the harder end of it before I take out the easy piece, you know? Yeah. Well, I ran uh, my first graph. I ran for a while. It was just a, an elite TI with no side imaging, just trying to fully understand how graph works. And then picked up the, uh, the other one. And um, it was kind of a, Hey, I'm still going to, I'm still going to focus on these, but I really need to work on my side imaging, understanding the side imaging, what I'm looking at. And that's what I'm going through now is because I can see fish on there, but then there's other times where I'm like, is that, is that really a fish or what, what am I looking at here? Um, and most of the time it's whenever they're just, they're sitting and mm -hmm. uh, you see the small shadows and things like that. So that, that's something that I'm trying to work on. Um, yeah. F fish identification on side imaging is something I'm still working on too. But I was like you, I started with a Ray Marine Dragonfly and it didn't have side imaging. So you're doing traditional sonar and down scan, which is great still. But yeah, I stepped up to a Element 9. I had a Hummingbird and all that stuff, but I stepped up to an Element 9 and with side imaging. And that was the graph that really like gives you a piece of the puzzle you didn't realize you didn't have. Yeah. You know, when you, when you identify something on, you know, for any of our, you know, listeners that are just maybe you know, getting into electronics, you know, when you identify something on your chirp and you see it on your down scan, you can identify where exactly, cause you know, it's a cone, but you can use that side scan to identify where you need to cast. I mean, it tells you exactly. like, if you see it, you're like, Oh, 35 foot to my left, you know? And, uh, it was a huge piece of the puzzle. And I, you know, now I'm working on, and when we had riser on, I think Adam riser on last time he was talking about it, being able to identify like, you know that that is a bass. That's probably a catfish. That is a carp. You know, that's yeah. like my next step is to try and understand that. Because right now I'm just like, I think that's a fish. I'm going to throw a bait at it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, I can't tell you, like, the first time I was throwing a jigging, uh, like, just throwing a jigging spoon with uh, just down imaging, it was like, why are they not hitting it? And then you get the side imaging and you're like, yeah, because you're 20 feet away from it exactly like, why don't you head that way a little bit so um yeah that was a that was a big deal for me and i'm i'm trying to just kind of kick back and be like, look you're not buying it not to you fully understand how to use what you have now um, i feel you on that man and it also mm -hmm. makes my pocketbook feel better because that's a pricey investment oh yeah yeah exactly it's that's like the downside you already to get it. the expensive unit and then you got to get basically a second expensive unit for that expensive unit but yep you know, Oh, now, yeah. It'll be cool. Like I definitely, I try to play it in my mind. Like, yeah, but you could use it for crappie fishing. Ain't no cheating to crappie fishing. You're eating the crappie. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but yeah. So we'll we'll get back to it. So you uh you scanned over, found some laying into the ditch. Yeah. So what happened? Um, caught the decent one. It was um it was a seventeen, I believe, cast out there. And as soon as I caught that one, it it was like it woke up the entire school um those fish are firing and just chasing bait top water and oh. i mean yeah and they wouldn't hit a like they're not gonna hit a top water bait i threw a jerk bait to see if they'd hit that 
but the Kitek was just kind of the the go to. I mean, they would hit it every time you put in there at them. Um, but it, they would come up very sporadic. They'd bust and then they'd dive back down. And that area, I just kind of, I'd work and kind of chase the more or less the school around in that area as they would move around the, the ditch. Up. Yeah. Um, and I think by somewhere around like 945, I, I had 83 inches. And I was, I was feeling pretty good at that point, just saying, okay, hey, I've come out here. No, no time to prefish. I've got a yeah, winter, you know, like, yeah, it, I feel good about it. And it was a, no matter what, how it turns out, I feel good about how the day turned out so far. Um, and from like 10 o'clock until probably it was from 10 until one o'clock. I didn't catch anything like 12. I think it was like 1257 was the last fish that I caught for the day. But I had worked that ditch, and it was like they moved completely. Like, I searched the entire ditch, couldn't find them. And I could see them on my graph up on some of the docks. But it was um, more or less like a – it wasn't like your standard dock. It was like more like a marina-style dock. And there's a couple of boats on it. And you could see them up underneath it, but you could not – you couldn't get them to do anything. Um, so I ran up to a couple of other – more or less little creeks with some bitches in it to look for anything and, and yeah. at this point is your drive still pedaling kind of uphill yeah and it like the noise never even went away it was just there uh, and uh in the back of my head it was like maybe maybe they're leaving because your drive is so loud that uh, <laughs> that's a warning <laughs> they, they sign as you're coming, coming in. <laughs> yeah um i bet your legs so were I, cooked if you'd been chasing that oh, school man. around too yeah, it was, um, I definitely felt it that day. So, but I went up and checked a couple more ditches and there was nothing there. So I was like, well, I'm going to go back and maybe they're, maybe they're there now again. Maybe they've kind of, they, they've noticed, hey, he's not here casting at us now. We can move back out. Um, so I went back in and I caught an 18 and a half on a drop shot and that was at 12:57. Yeah, exactly. Um, and they were sitting in like 30 foot. Oh. Um, yeah. So from there, it was kind of a, all right, this is one. I've got two and a half hours left. Maybe we can get a couple more because I had a 15 and a half that I just could not get rid of. Um, but at that point, I think I had 88 and a quarter. And honestly, in the back of my mind, like Tom was fishing the tournament. He was right behind me the whole time. Dylan Lowry was there fishing as well. Uh, both of those guys are hammers. And, uh, I mean, there's a couple of guys that were fishing it that were just, they're either A, going to come in the front really heavy, or they're going to come in at the back end very heavy. And, yeah. I mean, there wasn't that much of a gap between us that was like, oh, that's, I'm far enough ahead that I felt comfortable. It was like, hey, these guys catch three 17-inch fish they're they're beating me right so uh it was never a comfortable spot and then i guess that that last hour where they cut the board off it was just kind of a i would say that was probably one of the the most stressful points because it was like i'm not catching any fish here they come (laughs) yeah here they come you know that there's going to be some moving um and then from there of course they don't release uh i think they had until four o'clock to submit fish so it was just another was back in my head it was like don't don't think that you've got it, but just keep in the back of your mind that today was a good day. I mean, any day yeah, fishing, you got to sit there and be humble and be like, you had a good yeah. day. Whatever happens, happens. Where there is that other little yeah. guy on your shoulder that's like, I did better than everybody else. This is mine. <laughs> well, it was uh, because I know how I am. Like I'm getting hyped about something, and then the, just the devastation where those some of those tournaments where you're like. <laughs> man this is a great day and then all of a sudden someone walks in there with like 90 something inches and you're like what happened and where was this guy the entire time um i can't look at some guy feeling. sandbag exactly sandbaggers yeah. i hate sandbaggers i cannot stand yes people it, that it's wait so until frustrating the clock goes off to like why i don't know what you gain from it yeah and, and honestly 
like I think my the biggest thing that frustrates me about that is a lot of those guys don't understand that your directors are now having to rush through all that to get those fish checked, scored, and then make sure that everything's done by the weigh-in. And the people that wait on that, and there's 30 minutes now, you've got five guys that just uploaded five fish. And some of these tournaments, there's only two or three people, if that, checking fish. Oh, I understand. I, I tournament do, do tournament director for Bass Nation for Alabama. And yeah. we were on Smith Lake this year. And now part of it was Tourney X turned off early on me. Uh, I had two tournaments going at the same time. Somehow one of them cut off early. Probably my mistake, but I didn't. I don't know how I missed it. But it turned off like 30 minutes early, whatever. Um, they text me. Everybody's letting me know. I run to town to get signal. And I, I've, I've scored tons of tournaments by myself. Usually, like you said, you have those 10 to 25 fish after the yeah. end sometimes. I had 88 fish that came in in the oh last Lord. 30 minutes. And I did it by myself sitting in a gas station parking lot Wi-Fi. And, like, you talk about, and, like, everybody was, you know, worried about time. So we did it, like, in the tournament, you know, uh, last call for pictures, and then boom, 10 minutes yeah. later we were going to do awards. And it's I sat in that gas station parking lot for 40 minutes. Just click, 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 you click, 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 click. I mean, yeah, that's you the only time I've ever done it. I was like, damn, I wish I had someone else doing this or some help, you know? Normally it's not for me. It's because, like, I, I'll stick with it. Like, if a, one of the clubs here wants uh, me to score a tournament, you know, I'll just leave it up. You know, I'll be at the house getting stuff done and I'll make sure I just come periodically check just to keep it going. Yeah. I mean, never been a problem. That one, I don't know if I'll ever score one by myself again if there's more than 30 people in it because that was ridiculous. It was 61 anglers and. I think it was like 180 fish caught or something like that. It was a lot wow. of fish, but and yeah, no, I, I hate to say it, like, but that could be like um, that could be the difference whether or not someone wins or not because someone screwed up. I mean, as simple yeah. as I mean, yeah. and not saying that it's a a you screw up, it's a their their screw up, and because you're going through it trying to do what you can. I mean, you just never know what can happen. So that's another reason it kind of frustrates me because it's like, you know, take, take these guys into consideration. They do enough already. Um, yeah, don't make them and like me rush too bad. I don't, I, I don't want to be that come from behind win that you never saw coming. The, like, yeah. I don't want you to see the board go off with me zero and then I beat you. I want to wire to wire beat you, or I want you to see that I'm quarter inching my way up to you because that's yep. going to make you sweat. Like, I yeah. will cause you to screw up just by putting the pressure on you. I, that's how I want to beat somebody. Yeah. You know, I want them to know I was coming for them. And yeah, it's exactly. the same guys that sandbag every time, everywhere. Yep. Like, I, national trails, local trails, you know who's going to do it. They, and they're yeah. always going to do it. Because there's no, I mean, there'll never be a rule against it, I don't think. Because, I mean, it doesn't hurt, you know. Yeah. I mean, even though us directors would probably argue that and say, yes, no, it stresses me out. A little bit. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so, yeah, no, I, I feel you, man. I sitting there wondering if you won you got a bunch of hammers in this tournament with you but uh continue on man well actually yeah, so, step back you, you didn't tell yeah. me about this uh 20 and a quarter yeah so um 20 and a quarter that one came big old um, spot um i yeah i had two back-to-back 17s and they they came up started firing away top water and i cast that stick out there and as soon as it hit the water, he just crushed it. And it was, um, I, I knew it was a big one because the ones there, they just, they fight, of course. Um, and I, I was using a medium spinning reel. That's smaller baits. I like to, to use rod. a medium spinning reel. Yeah, yeah, he was putting in work that day. He caught a lot of fish. <laughs> and um, I have to say, that was the first tournament I fished with that rod. Um, I was very impressed with the rod. And, and shout uh, out, what was it? Yeah, it was a St. Croix. It's the the Legend Extreme. Um, yeah. It's their carbon fiber. Probably, it is a favorite rod. It's not for everybody because it is expensive. But on a day like that day, when when they were biting it, when you're pulling it to the schools, if they weren't grabbing it immediately. Like you couldn't feel anything but a light take, and yeah. having that rod 
with the sensitivity that it does, that made the difference because you'd be reeling it and not even realize that there's something on there. Um, because when they hit it, they're not, they don't always just dive down. Um, so I, I, for me, that was the, the biggest thing for me was the, the couple that I caught that were just light ticks and you would think that maybe they were just bumping it. They'd have it and they were just, yeah. Um, so, but he, he got it and I, I fought him for a good bit, but as he comes up, he's just thrashing everywhere and just spitting bait out left and right. And the bait was that two inch and three inch size. Um, and I know a lot of people for Lake Lanier, they're like, oh, you know, four inch, five inch. They like to throw the, the four inch contact. And I'm a fan, but um, that easy oh, shiner nice. was the ticket for yeah, sure. Man. You know, you if you ever, you know, this is a tip for anybody that's fishing. If you pay attention when you're just outfit, even if you're just fun fishing to, to the bait, like how often, I mean, it's different for different areas. Like I've seen some giant thread fin on Del Hollow, you know. Yeah. But typically when you find bait, I mean, they're little shiners. When you catch a fish and it spits them up, they're hardly ever over three inches. And, you know, yeah. like you talking about using the easy shiners on a little jig head. Uh, one of my go-tos last year was the uh, Mega Bass Okashira head. Little bitty jig head with that little weird spinner on it and i'd put a two inch yep. kypec on it or an easy shiner and you i mean people would think you know some people think that small bait small fish no nope. like no. everything wants it <laughs> like, yeah well in uh, in times i throw an underspin a lot um oh yeah but i swear i think sometimes and this would just be me like i can throw in a school and i can pick off one or two on an underspin and then it's like they'll just stop immediately. It's like they, they key in on it and they're like, yeah, something don't look, don't look normal about that. I don't, I don't know what it is. Um, but for me that day, it was like, I'm, I'm going with something small and kind of focusing on that. Um, but yeah, I got him in and uh, after him, that's when it all just kind of died out. I mean, every bit of it just, they stopped busting and there was a couple of boats that came in there but they would work the banks and then just leave. There was probably four boats that worked the banks and then just left. They never even went into the ditch and did anything. So, I don't know why I, which I'm okay with. No, it's great. I mean, like, I don't know why this time of year you wouldn't check back off. I mean, I like to fish the bank, so God knows I'd have at least tried it. But yeah, I'm yeah, also yeah. smart enough to be like, okay, no, they're not here. You know, it's freezing. You know, they're it's not the right time of year. You know. But, uh, you know, going back to the, the rod, you're talking about, you know, super expensive. Um, anybody that's getting into fishing, you know, buy what you can afford. Um, and, you know, don't live by what some people say. You know, they say it's not the arrow, it's the Indian. Well, really nice arrow helps, you know. So, yeah. Yep. I used to be the guy that, you know, I'd buy the combos at Academy, you know, whatever was a good little $100 deal. And they work. I mean, I still have some of that stuff, like the Abu Garcia Black Max. Oh, something yeah. Something about that. You can't kill those things. Like, yeah. I still keep one with me just in case. If, like, there's something <laughs> sketchy that needs to be done, that rod mm -hmm. reel comes out. But, uh, yeah. you know, first time someone lets you check out a high-end rod, it'll, like, really change your whole mindset on it. The first time you, like, a buddy of mine, we were frog fishing, which is something you don't think about sensitivity wise, you know, most time it's visual. So yeah, I was fishing a frog, same frog. He was using a Shimano, uh, Corrado setup and a, uh, Dobbins and we swapped rod and reels and like being able to feel it switch directions, you know, yeah. not even look at it. You can feel it switch. You know, if something, if you're looking, not paying attention and something just does that, my favorite way they eat it where they just, suck it down from below and it just disappears like at night you can't see it. oh yeah you feel it though and there's yep. tons of times that you may have just thought you got snagged up on something so you didn't set the hook so you're just trying to pop your frog loose but that moving up the you know sensitive rod just it's a different level and i'm a believer now like the reels you need nice reels but i'll spend yeah. way more on a rod than a, i don't i still don't really understand like a 400 hundred dollar reel my hundred, hundred and fifty dollar reels. I mean, even my, I do have one bougie reel. You know, my Corrado DC is two fifty, 
and it's really nice, but Shimano SLX DC is the same thing for 170 bucks. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. But the, spend the money on the rods. Like anybody yeah. that's getting into this, taking it somewhat serious, do yourself one favor this year, buy you one nice rod, you know, 150 yeah, at least dollars. one, just yeah. one. try it. And then, you know, you'll get a credit card and get the rest of them or something like that's how it happens. But <laughs> well, and I never thought about it, but like when I started fishing a drop shot, that's what they said. They're like, look, a lot of times you will never feel that fish. grab that bait. And it's just a matter of having, you need the right tools for the job. And I good think rod, good having, rate. yeah, I mean, you just, you have to invest in certain things. And I'm, I'm a believer now. Um, I like the victory. That was the, my drop shot rod that I was using from St. Croix. And that's their just, newest one. Phenomenal rod. Yeah. Um, yeah. I haven't checked those out yet. I'm a, I'm a Dobbins guy, like through and through. Yeah. Every, I think every on our rod I own now, but like one is a Dobbins and it's just cause I haven't replaced it yet. But, yeah. uh, Good the St. Croix stuff's nice. Like those legend, uh, the legend glass rods are, Oh yeah. Yeah. They're really cool. Really. A lot of people, uh, you know, people that don't know too much to look at them. They're like kind of bulky. No. First time you lean into a fish on one of those, man, that's it feels better, different. Right? Different. And yeah. <laughs> I know a hundred percent. Like I went from, I would fish a crankbait and I was okay with fishing a crankbait. It was like, eh, it's okay, but I miss a lot of fish on it. And then they're like, Hey, why don't you try this glass rod? I'm like, why would I even try that? And then trying it. And then I caught so many more fish and same thing with my chatterbait. I use a glass rod for my chatterbait and I catch so many more fish now on both those baits. And a lot of it's having the right tools and they just, when they load up on that glass, it feels different and the rod does what it's supposed to. It's not you doing what you're supposed to with the rod. A lot of times it's, it's allowing the rod to work. Yeah. So that, uh, definitely with crankbaits, I've had a lot of luck with glass. I still haven't got my combo right for chatterbaits yet with a glass rod. Uh, I, I bought one of Dobbins extreme for it and it's just a little too soft. I can't really punch the hook in with it because that it been, it's got so much bend. But I t- turned around and took that and put it on deep cranking rod or used it as yeah. a deep cranking rod money. Like that, I was like, oh, okay, cool. I'll keep it. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Money well spent on accident. But uh, I- I'm still a, I like heavy, like a heavy chatterbait rod, no matter what cover. I'm That's fishing, what I throw. I-, I like a, I like a meaty rod to really just, you know, pop them. Yep. But, but, it, but I- I'm guilty of those. Like, you know, it could be a 12 inch fish. I'm going to give it the old hero hook set. You know, I'm going to reel oh, down cause. over and it looks cool. It feels good too, especially when it feels you're having good. a rough day. That first bite, ooh, I'm wrecking yeah. you. Like, <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. There, there's something to be said whenever you're fishing. And for me, it doesn't matter kayak, boat, when a fish hits it and the timing of you setting it and everything just lines up the way it's supposed to, there's no feeling. I mean, it, it's just, it's amazing. It's I mean, it's the best feeling that there is out there when it comes to, to fishing. So I, I think my, my favorite thing about it is, like you said, that feeling. And then it's like a roller coaster of feelings every every hookup, every cast, man. Because it's like you hit this high because, you oh, I'm on. And then it's another high. Oh, it's big. And then it's a low. Oh, damn, he came off. But it's just like. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Gosh, I bet you if there was a statistic they could do, I bet fishermen are like the highest percentile of the people with heart problems. I would guarantee it. <laughs> it caused, but it's causing it. I know it. Oh, well, uh, back to the tournament though. So, you know, uh, leaderboard was off. You weren't sure. Uh, and uh, we have you here. So we all know that you won. How, how'd it go? Yeah. Um, so from there, from, from 1257, I didn't catch a fish for the rest of the day. Um, I started slowly making my way back to the ramp, fishing kind of the same water. Um, I could, you could feel the temperature start dropping tremendously outside. Mm. I wanted to make sure that I got back in time, make sure that I was off the water and nothing happened to my drive. So, because I mean, the wind was still blowing. Um, did you have that so I get back where the wind was blowing? in your face one way and then you turned around and it was blowing in your face again because god just felt like doing that uh, you know it was one of those where you'd get to certain areas and it'd be blowing at you but most of the time it was just blowing me into the bank so Ugh. um yeah it was it was just one of those like well you know i guess it's better than uh, 
than it being blowing my face. So I'll take that. <laughs> so, Very um, true. yeah. So, but the, the rain held off. Um, I get back to the ramp and uh, of course I get back to the ramp and all the bass boats are pulling up to the ramp as well. And it's like, all right, well, I guess we're going to sit here and let them unload and, uh, let them do their tournament thing. So, um, but, uh, but yeah, so I'm, uh, my wife was watching the leaderboard and keeping up with it. And of course I looked at it at like, I guess, 228, 229. And I was still, I guess, three, well, four or five inches ahead. So I was like, okay, well, we'll see what happens. Um, Nothing like a good five inch lead because that, in our sport, yeah. that's a good comfort zone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so within that last hour, I was like, well, there's only an hour left. Maybe the bite will just continue where it's at. Um, I know guys were catching fish, but they just, they were making small upgrades, nothing major. And honestly, I didn't, I didn't know anything about it except for whenever I got back to the ramp and I get to the way in, I talked to Tom and uh, Tom said he didn't make any more advancement. So I was like, okay, well, I feel good about that, but there's a couple of other guys about about him that could have, they could have jumped. So, um, but they started, they started reading off the, the leaderboard as we get there and uh, I was feeling better, better about it. And, I got big bass because it was a, a roll down. My uh, my second biggest fish was 18 and a half, and I think the other Josh's was maybe 17 and a half. 17 and a, 17 and a quarter. Josh would do. 17 and a quarter, yep. Um, there ain't nothing that'll make you more mad than losing big bass to a second fish, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, I didn't, and honestly, I, there's been a couple of shows I've fished with that are they're like, oh, it's done by time stamp. So whoever caught the biggest first, is the one who gets mm. big bass and it's like oh, okay and then there was another one they're like oh it's based off of whoever has the most total inches and then i kid you not i fished another one that it was like oh you guys caught the same size bass oh you split it and i'm like huh like so sorry <laughs> Pardon. yeah so this is four total uh different hey you got big bass this is how you get paid um so from that, whenever they, they get a third place, they call out Tom. And Tom sat in second behind me the whole day. And when they called his name for third place, I was like, oh, oh crap. <laughs> someone did make it. Someone did make a move. Um, and uh, that was like, all right, well, well, we'll see what happens. And then they called Dylan's name uh, for second place. And it was like, okay, this this feels good now. This is it. it, it yeah, it's like the sky opened up. It was uh, it was a great moment because Lake Lanier is probably one of my favorite lakes to fish. Um, I'm on the dugout staff. It's their tournament, so it just kind of another little staple, I guess you'd say. So oh, yeah, uh, no. it was it was a feel good moment where it was just like, all right, that this is what it's about. So oh no, dude, uh, you know you earned it. You uh, you slid in right there with a, a roll down but you 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 did what all of us hope we could do in that situation is to go out and like show that you deserved that spot so you know congrats to you because you did and like you said uh thank you our man josh had 88 and a quarter to win it with that 20 and a quarter big bass uh dylan lowry was second place with 83 and three quarters he had like a four and a half inch lead which is that's money uh tom kazmierski who is you know that's someone that's a force to reckon with again uh, 83 yeah. and a quarter. Um, my man from down here, John Bubba Jones, uh, fourth place with 80 and a half. Congrats to him. And then fifth place with Joseph Guyton with 80 and a half. So it was only five people in the 80s, uh, a few right outside of the 80s. But, you know, getting that close to 90 this time of year, especially spotted bass, I feel like oh, that's a great day, you know. I felt good about it. I, I would. Man, definitely one you can hang your hat on and – I mean, outside of, I mean, you can even hang your hat on that. Yeah, my legs are a little more muscular, just because of the, <laughs> the, the boat. You know, I, I made it. I made it happen. But, uh, but yeah, man, con- congrats to you on that, and congrats to Doug out for another uh, excellent uh, little fun side series and the championship. And you, I'm sh- sure you took home a pretty pretty good little little check. And uh, have yep. any have any cool giveaways that went with this one, or was it just payout? No, so it was um, it was 150 for big bass, and it was 711 for first place. 
Nice. And then we had the choice between a Jackson kayak or a Newport motor with two 60 amp Dakota lithium batteries to power it. Um, that. Yeah, so I, I, I chose the Newport and uh, yes, that. <laughs> we'll be getting that installed hopefully this week. So, uh, but, I'm, uh, I, I'm part of the New Canoe team and that company partners with us. Um, I've been watching that company come from out of nowhere for a while now. Yeah. And oh, yeah. I haven't heard any bad things because at first what everybody was complaining about was not having the battery pack like a Torquedo, but yeah. you don't realize what that gives you the range to do. You know, you hook up. Yep. I mean, I know guys running twin 100s that are God knows what kind of distance you can get with that before you kill one, but like killer yeah. systems, they're, apparently they're not too loud. Um, like the first 403s were notorious for being kind of loud. 403 ACs are quieter. The 1103 is silent, but the uh, the new ports are supposedly pretty quiet. Uh, run real good. Those Dakota batteries will do you great. So that's a cool cool. So do you do you run any kind of motor setup now, or are you just strictly pedaling? Um, I was running an XI3. Um, so when I had my my pursuit, that's what I ran was my XI3. And when I picked up the Hobie, I just I pulled it over to the Hobie and was using it on the Hobie. But I found myself mainly with the speed, the um, the speed of the XI3 was like right at four miles an hour. Well, I was getting that out of my pedal drive anyways, and it was just something extra I was having to take with me. And it was like, you know what? Yeah, it was more weight, and the spotlight worked great. But with that drive system, the way that it operates with the 360, like that is your spotlight. I mean, it, it just it performs it's almost overkill yeah yeah um so it's like i'll use the new port to get from a and b and then use yeah. my drive once i get there um so and luckily enough that drive didn't break made it back and everything was good You're one of the lucky so, ones uh, man <sighs> well, and and nothing against hobie or anything but i you hear a lot of it's never like a brand new hobie 360 breaks or anything but you i've heard tons of stories about them coming apart you know not being able to rotate not pedaling anymore getting loud all that stuff so glad it worked out for you and you didn't have to paddle that one. <laughs> oh yeah and you know i for i can i've come more or less from a manufacturing style background where it's like you know if it's mechanical it's gonna break it's just when it breaks um but i've seen some stuff that these guys do to these drives tossing them in the back of the trucks just i mean more or less hey it's a tool we're just gonna talk it here this is where it goes and uh, i mean literally it's I how I treat tossing on the pavement. well and i have to a point where but now it's like i i know i can't just grab a, a hobie drive and throw it on the pavement because something's gonna break um and so <laughs> <laughs> and, and i've seen guys do it they just grab it and they'll toss it up on the pavement it's like uh you realize how much money that is and if that breaks like it's like you can be half a little price upset. Of the boat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The price of the boat now, um, but yeah. So, but I mean, either way, I mean, it it did like it was supposed to do, and um, we were able to. I, I get back, and uh, Jamie, the guys at the dugout, they take care of me, no issues, get everything corrected on it, and I mean, yeah. it, it's one good thing to have a cool shop that supports you as much as they do because they're there to take care of you. I was so, just about to say, man, um, you know, mechanical failures and things happen, like you said, but it it's not as big of a deal as if you've got a good support system. You know, people that can help you out, will help you out, and know how to take care of it. Because, like, you know, that that's me with... I, I'm a, I'm a kind of a, a fix-it-myself guy. You know, I've always been real mechanically inclined, so when people are like, oh, stay away from this, you know, it's it might break. I'm like, cool. I'll fix it. Like I'm okay yep. with it. Like just, I'll yep. take it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, man, yep. uh, I appreciate you coming on. You, uh, congrats again on a great event out there. Uh, I'm hoping we'll get to, we'll have you back on, um, winning a Hobie or, you know, a bass event, you know, nation event, whatever you, you get into. But, uh, we always like to give our guests a chance to shout out anybody that makes it easier for them to, to do this little ride. So, uh, who, who you got behind you? Um, so the dugout bait and tackle, uh, those are, uh, those guys are my, my number one sponsor. Uh, they take care of me really well. 
And then I signed on with St. Croix just at the end of last year. Sweet. So those guys do really well. And uh, Fishhead Spin, they're they're another shop that, or another another sponsor that takes care of me. Uh, and I, I work with them as well. So it just kind of, everything works out well on that side. So uh, those are my, my three top ones. But then we've got One Objective and Rogue Fishing Co. Those guys help me with my brackets on the kayak for the motors. And uh, and then also the, the phone leash. That that thing has saved my butt more times than Mark I can tell. it out of park with that. Yeah, yeah. I've got, uh, I've got like so. three of them. Just, I've got backups. I've got his, uh, yep. his little drag strap. That I love that thing. Um, yeah. What you got the new one, the one with the cam is the new one longer? On oh no! I so don't have yeah, it's, yeah. So it, it hooks up to the front. It's got a cam buckle on it that you can adjust the length by the cam buckle. Yeah, I'll be calling Mark here in a few minutes. Yeah, it's I, nice. I love his stuff, man. I he uh, I've ran into him a couple times up there at uh, the shop I work with, Music City. He's a great dude. Any, I'll give him a plug for sure. Uh, if anybody's looking for a cool phone tether, catchboard tether, drag strap, anything like that, give my man over there at Rogue Fishing Mark a, a look. If he makes good stuff, quality gear. I think he's got some cool hats now yeah. too. So check his stuff out. Oh yeah, that merch. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Exactly. Well, awesome, man. Well, uh, another great show. Uh, like always, we thank everybody for following us, uh, giving us a listen. Hope we help make your drives easier, get you through your day at work, whatever's going on. Uh, I think that's it. Well, like I said, we'll see y'all next week and we will, or the, the next show, I'm sorry, will be a, a recap of how things go down at Kissimmee. Hopefully, uh, me and the OG Brian will be on the show telling you about how we straight smacked them in Kissimmee. We call it like five, 10 pounders, won a whole bunch of money and then there came home. That's probably not true, but I'm going to hold my head up really <laughs> high. So, uh, we thank y'all again well, and we'll luck. see y'all. I appreciate luck, it, brother. Peace out. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in to another killer episode on Paddle and Fin. Don't forget to go check out our website at paddle, the letter N, and fin.com. Don't forget to check out the YouTube channel at Paddle and Fin. If you got a question, comment, want to hear from a future guest on a future episode, feel free to email us at paddle, the letter N, and fin at gmail.com. Don't forget to follow us on social media at Paddle and Fin on Facebook and Instagram. Shout out to our show supporters, Angler, the Angler Button, and and app just makes for a better time on the water and creates a virtual logbook for every fishing outing out on the water. Shout out to Rocktown Adventures, located in Northern Illinois, for all your kayaking, camping, and hiking needs. Shout out to Jigmasters Jigs. When in doubt, get the jig out. Go to Jigmasters.